In this chapter, we're going to talk about the land use plan and the transportation element. Um, I'm going to use the I'm going to continue to use the actual document to kind of flip through this, but I'm also going to flip through the summary presentation board that you can find at the beginning of the um, uh, virtual open house materials. There are nine different summary boards, and those summary boards give us a, a very condensed version of the land use chapter, but we can see them, all the different elements of that together. So I'm going to jump to the land use uh, chapter and I'm again going to use that navigation bar to the left to do to go through this. In the land use chapter, this is usually the, the most prominent element of a comprehensive plan where we're looking at every parcel in the city and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best uh, uh, pattern of land use within a particular area. We have a little bit of background. A lot of this we've already talked about through the report card. Um, but we elaborate a little bit more on this material to paint that picture of what the city currently uh, looks like from a land use pattern standpoint. Um, we describe all of those uses so you can get a feel for what we mean by the different land use categories that we have. We try to break it down so you can look at the different components. The residential areas that you see here, kind of the age of when development occurred by what decade, as you see there. Market valuations, it gives us an idea of the value of the different land investments that helps understand what the market's willing to do or not willing to do. Um, looking at some of the commercial uses in the city, largely in the southern portion of the city, but we might look in the future as growth continues to go to the north, some of those uh, patterns will, will begin to emerge. <clears throat> we talk a little bit about assets and barriers. And one of the big challenges in Johnston you have a couple of key features that really divides the city between an east and west pattern as well as a north and south pattern. The Beaver Creek uh, network of streams is the, the divider that, that disconnects kind of the east and west side um, where we have to have bridges to cross those uh, areas. And in the north and south, we look at the Camp Dodge land holdings that creates a, a challenge when we think about road connections to the north. We're not going to have a road that goes through Camp Dodge. Instead, we have to navigate to the west or the east. And so any growth that does happen up in this northern part, which has been envisioned for quite some time, uh, has to, to navigate around that. So those become uh, rather significant challenges in the city. When we talk about future land use, we start, uh, as we have with other chapters, with a set of uh, common land use goals. That, that make sure that we have a, a diversity of land uses that support uh, a robust growth pattern, which in turn supports the desired economic development strategies that we have, um, making sure that we have adequate utilities and infrastructure to serve them. We have a set of policies, and here we have quite a few policies that really get at uh, how do we make sure that as new development happens, it's done in a way that, that ensures uh, a resilient and sustainable community. And so all those policy initiatives are broken out by different land use categories so that they can be applied to specific projects, but as well as uh, some general categories. We have both residential and commercial policies that you see here. We also have mixed land use policies. And one of the strategies there is to offer a little bit of flexibility so that we can ensure good design and good placemaking, but enable uh, a diversity of both housing and jobs and shopping to occur in one uh, essential place. That helps with sort of the resiliency when you think about areas that can sustain uh, major changes in consumer behavior as well as changes in market demand and also places where we, we desire to have a certain amount of critical mass or density that supports uh, some of the objectives and, and desires that the community has expressed. Um, we have other policies and whatnot that address uh, some of the, the institutional uses in the city, such as Camp Dodge and the Sailorville storm, storm area. Sailorville water area. Um, we also reflect some of the prior planning in initiatives here. It's important to respect uh, all the work that has been done in the past, including some of the Merle Hay Road master planning work and the, the comprehensive plan from 2030. And so a lot of these are carried forward. Uh, the last thing that we have are a series of implementation strat strategies. And uh, those strategies are the physical actions that we would do following up to the comp plan. Um, one of the key directives is to update the zoning code and the subdivision code, and those are the laws. Um, the comp plan serves as a guide, as a, as a direction, if you will. The zoning ordinance gets to the specific elements of the, the physical laws, and these strategies are, are what we would update with the zoning code uh, key areas. Continue to facilitate redevelopment uh, and new development along Merle Hay Road, and, and we heard people talk a lot about placemaking. Uh, the town center area is a great example of of where that's happening now and the city is playing a key role in helping 
catalyze um, the improvements there to create those. This is the future land use map. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to the uh, presentation boards. And so this is, this is a different view here. This is the summary board that we've created uh, rather than going through the full document and talk about the land use plan from, from that perspective. When you look at the land use plan itself, we have a series of colors representing the yellows and browns represent varying degrees of residential from your lower density, uh, single family detached product type to more of a mixed, uh, some attached side by side to uh, ultimately to the brown where you get to the higher density uh, vertical uh, multifamily housing development. These mixed use categories would also accommodate some of that vertical uh, oriented uh, multifamily housing. The reds are trying to depict more of a, a commercial retail or service oriented use, sort of those gathering places, if you will, as well as the retail goods and services. The purple is more of an employment concentration, whether it be a light industrial business park type of use or office type uses. And the gray areas represent more of that industrial pattern, which is largely isolated over to uh, existing areas along uh, Beaver Drive. When you look at this map, you see this dashed line here that represents the city's current city boundary as of the end of 2019 or early 2020. Any growth that happens outside of that would be growth that, that has to first go through an annexation process uh, and then a rezoning process. And all of those are public processes. Um, those processes can be initiated by property owners or if uh, enough property owners uh, initiate a process and, and there are holes, if you will, within it. There are other legislative processes where the city can make sure efficiencies are realized and annexation occurs in an orderly way. And so that has to happen. Uh, this plan does not initiate that. That's driven by market demand and growth demand. And if there's a project, uh, then those planning steps need to take place. But this land use plan paints that picture of what those uses could be. Um, it's largely uh, intended to provide for a mix of uses that are, again, resilient. Uh, if we painted it all one color, saying it was all low density residential, that doesn't support the commercial services that are desired, that doesn't support the walkability destinate walkable destinations that are desired, uh, nor does it necessarily support um, the, the balance in uh, usage of things like schools uh, and job creation. So, so we have to make sure that we accommodate a, a variety of land use patterns in different places to create those sustainable neighborhoods. We have a series of focus areas, and these are the, the change areas, if you will, where the land use patterns are really are a little bit different. And these, uh, I would encourage you to spend some time zooming in, reading the annotations here that describe why some of the uses are what they are. Um, we met with folks within many of these areas to talk about uh, how these changes occur. And we integrated uh, a lot of the ideas that were expressed through different uh, meetings, but not all. There are some places where uh, people don't envision growing and we're not, again, forcing that growth. That growth, this, these patterns are really just an illustration of a desired land use pattern that enables the city to plan for uh, if growth did occur, what kind of infrastructure needs would we have? And how do these growth patterns also then support that, that desired mix of uh, different housing types um, and patterns, as well as uh, job types and services in retail? Merle Hay Road is looked at from a standpoint of continued uh, evolvement of redevelopment and, and revitalization. Um, we've largely kept a similar land use pattern as what has been envisioned along that corridor, allowing for a variety of mixed use patterns that enable uh, some of that uh, diversity in product type and really focus more at commercial being kind of along the front, along the core, uh, particularly on the south side area here with some higher density housing and mixed use along the back sides. If we think about this corridor as sort of the robust vital corridor of the, of the community, where that placemaking opportunity, and, and if you recall the town center site here, uh, creates that synergy of activities and that placemaking. Um, we really need to think about higher densities that supports redevelopment occurring on its own rather than uh, being uh, highly subsidized by uh, taxpayers in the city. And so creating higher density helps with that aspect as well as helping with keeping some of the commercial uses and the retail uses vital because you've got stronger uh, rooftops uh, in that area, uh, more rooftops, and people that both would work at those locations as well as patronize them. 
So uh, this really continues with that theme uh, along the Merle Hay Road corridor. The other areas I'm not going to talk as much about because those are largely infill areas. Uh, and uh, the key things that we want to think about are policies that talk about transitioning. So in a lot of these areas, you see higher density backing up to existing single family density. And to the extent that we can accommodate those through design, landscaping, uh, features, then we would still try to accommodate uh, that transitioning from higher to lower density uses. We have land use typology boards. So if you're curious about what these different land use categories mean, you can go in and review these uh, different typologies to see some pictures that illustrate the product types, as well as paragraphs that describe it in detail. That is the land use chapter. Um, the, the highlights that I wanted to hit on there. Um, I'm going to also switch over to back over to the plan document and I'm going to go to the transportation chapter and just talk real quickly at a high level about that. Roads are a critical piece to a community. We want to focus on things like having a strong network, uh, key major roads that are spaced to get people from uh, from their neighborhoods to key destinations. And so you'll see language in here that talks about uh, networks. And uh, a key component of that network and thinking about those streets uh, over time as, as traffic grows and as demand grows and streets are uh, reconstructed or, or redone, we want to think about redoing them in a fashion that's what we call complete streets. And that idea is making sure that we accommodate all modes of travel within a street corridor or as many modes of travel other than just one, just the vehicle. So we think about transit, we think about uh, pedestrian uh, walking and biking, and we make sure that those corridors can accommodate uh, all aspects. We see Merle Hay Road as a great opportunity uh, to do a pilot study to figure out how do we improve the uh, public realm within that corridor and the street function within that corridor to be consistent with some of the redevelopment planning that's been uh, envisioned and that is happening along that corridor. So we see that as a key implementation initiative. Other than that, the transportation chapter does look a lot at uh, uh, um, pedestrian and bicycle movements uh, and building off of planning that's been done in the city to improve walkability. And this chapter also works in tandem with uh, the parks, trails and recreation chapter to look at that aspect. So with that, I think I'm going to stop there. In the next uh, video, we'll get into uh, economic development and housing.